And yes, Anne Thompson, I am so happy that you're here. So Anne is the producer and host of the SEG Discovery to Recovery podcast and the author of Innovation in Mineral Exploration. She's over 35 years experience working in and consulting to the mineral exploration industry through her company, Petra Science. So as an early adopter and with all her expertise, I am so excited to learn from her today about smart spectroscopy for exploration. So it's going to be a great session. Please keep using the chat and we'll open up the floor at the end. And yes, thank you so much, Anne, for joining. It's amazing having you. Thanks, Jess. Very good to be here. I've been waiting for this invitation. <laughs> so good. <laughs> yeah, part of the group. So yeah, it's great. And Thank you for everybody for, for joining us today. I'm currently on the lands of the Musqueam, Salatooth, and Coast Salish peoples. So uh, we have to, we acknowledge that here. And But my background is actually the Isle of Isla, which I recently had a lovely expedition to, to see rocks and whiskey. Um, anyway, without any more intro, I, I'll start here. And... Um, I just like to say I have had a quick look at the participants and there's quite a few of you who could do this talk as well or actually much better than I can do it. So I hope you join in or ask a question or clarify a point if you need to at any point. I have no problem with making this fairly informal if people have things to say. Um, so obviously, I've been around for a while and and when I first started in exploration, we didn't really have much PPE. Um, I'm here. I am underground working in a in a mine with artisanal miners. So I wasn't working. I was visiting a mine of artisanal miners in Indonesia, and something that probably wouldn't we wouldn't even think to do now. So, in the same way, spectroscopy has changed uh, quite a lot over the last decades as well. So we're just going to talk ab about that a bit and explore that. But here's the answer now. The future is now. This is the conclusion. We have fully portable mineral analysis at multiple scales. We have real-time access across any organization and, and company. And we have huge, large data sets that can be used in exploration, development, and recovery. So that's the reality of, of where we are. And of course, it also poses a lot of questions for how we, we actually make the most of what we're able to do. And some of this technology was developed and is continuing to be developed for use on the Mars rovers. So that's a lead in for your next talk in this, this series. So we'll look at a brief timeline of, of mineral spectroscopy. And when I first started and everybody would always say, oh, it's an untested tool. Like, how do you do that? Well, we actually, the early work and the early lab spectrometers in the early 1900s, um, and then from World War through World War II, 1940 to 85, there was a lot of development of, of um, bench scale um, scanners, spectrometers, and development of, of um, databases and mineral databases, so actually identifying minerals. So we move into the late 70s and 80s. And obviously there was a, a lot of effort and work going into remote sensing and Landsat and we had Landsat images. So we needed to be able to field check those images. We needed to, be able to figure out what was on the actually on the ground to compare to the remote sensing data. So that prompted a lot of interest in field portable spectrometers. Um, around the early 90s, 91, the Pima. Um, so a lot of this technology has come out of Australia for sure. <laughs> so um, Terry Cox and Integrated Spectronics you know, developed the Pima with Syro and um, John Huntington, who's I believe on the on this call as well. So they they know that history very well, and that was just a real game changer because it truly was an instrument that was more or less shoebox size that we could carry in the field and get immediate alteration mineral analysis in the field. So we continued to develop that through you know, many years of work and a lot of efforts in, in getting references and developing the technique. But what really happened, of course, and what really made it all go is like so much of our world is the digital explosion. And so the ability to process and handle lots and lots of data. And so that really kicked off uh, a whole lot of, of work. And then in addition to that was the continued development with HiLogger and CSIRO and John Hennington's work with HiLogger to develop a scanner. And then 
we have other scanners and more wavelengths, and we're going to get into all of that. So the big the big thing is that, you know, in the recent decade is we've just had this boom of all this stuff happening. And it's quite exciting, but it also means that for the user, you really need to have some understanding of what it all means and how it works in order to get the most out of it and to be able to ask the questions that you want to ask in order to ask the right questions to get the right techniques and tools and to understand what your data means. So that's part of what my effort is here, as, as well as looking at what are some things hanging out there in spectroscopy that we don't really have as good a grip on as maybe we think we do, and that really we need more research on and a bit more work. So I like to start here because these three individuals for me are all key in in this use of, of spectroscopy in exploration in particular and mining. So Phoebe Hoff, who I worked with, who died in 2019, she took that PIMA um, and she trotted all around the world and she went to so many museums and she analyzed so many samples and she developed in a massively beautiful reference database. And then she worked with the guys in exploration and, and, and actually really, really brought the technique into use in exploration and mining. John, I've already talked about. And then Sasha Ponchwell, who has retired now, um, worked also in that, that group and also developed, um, worked with the spectral geologist software. And then since in, in her last few years, developed Osiris, and we'll talk about that. She's retired, gone off to the beach. But these three people, for me, in the development of how we use it in exploration mining are really important. So we always say have lots of different scales of observation. I mentioned the remote sensing. We can look, um, use this technique on outcrops, and people are also mounting scanners on drones and using it for mapping pit walls. And then obviously there's the drill coal scale and chips. Um, there was a little, little discussion on LinkedIn in the last few days about, can we use these things for chips? Well, of course, it's a scanner. It's a spectral technique. You can use it to analyze a variety of sample types. And why are we doing it? So originally, as I said, there was the remote sensing driver, but there's also the big one, which is figuring out how does, does the minerals that we are identifying in the field fit into our deposit models? How can we use it to map alteration? How can we use it to vector towards mineralization? So obviously the, the image on the left, the porphyry model, this is one where we see a lot of spectral techniques applied. There's uh, numerous minerals that can be mapped, and it's extremely helpful. But it also can be used in massive sulfide deposits. It can be used in uranium deposits. It can be used in kimberlites. There's a, a wide variety of deposit types where spectral techniques can be really helpful. And then not only that, it's, so there's a variety of rocks and spectral types, um, deposit models, but also it's across the whole mining value chain. And in some ways, you could argue that the more you get into the understanding the ore body and ore body knowledge and geometallurgy that you might even find more uses than you might have actually even in exploration. So getting that data and starting at the beginning and carrying it through the whole program is, is quite important. So what is the current state? So I'm going to start with a couple of, of um, examples of what I view as kind of best practices in using field portable spectro spectrometers. These are mostly in... Um, uh, in advanced projects, but the one first one, the Anto deposit in Indonesia, which was discovered and is being developed by Vale and their subsidiary in Indonesia. This is on the island of Sumbawa and the eastern portion of Sumbawa Island. And it's in a very active um, environment. So we're talking active in the last 100,000 years. And in the cross section here, you can see at the top, this pale green um, unit is basically unaltered andesite. And so they had glimpse of alteration, lithocap type alteration up on the edges, on the flanks, but they really had nothing in this whole section of this, this green. And so the, the use of, of spectral techniques as they drilled was really important. So then the, the rest of the, the porphyry is in these, you know, classic finger intrusions and a whole variety of porphyry um, series of, of intermineral um, porphyries, and they're intruding into a large diatreme breccia. 
So a really exciting um, discovery. And the alteration that they mapped out using spectroscopy um, shows here, again, the green, which is basically illite smectite to unaltered rock, and then going down through a kaolinite and then a dickite zone into buggy quartz, quartz alienite, and then quartz perophyllite diaspore, which is basically lithocap all over printing onto porphyry. And so getting into those deep parts, finding the zuniite, the topaz, the devorniorite, those were all important parts of understanding the deposit. And these holes are quite, are quite deep. So if we actually look at the data they collected, they were collecting data every half a meter to meter. So that's a, a lot on, on deep drill holes that are going 800 to 1,000 meters deep. That's a lot of data. And of course, there's a lot of drill holes. So this is what some of their results looked like. They used TerraSpec field spectrometer, and they analyzed it with Osiris, and Sasha worked with them on this data. And so you can see like on this hole here, hole 34, it drilled through almost 400 meters of andesite before they started hitting alteration. But then as they drilled down, they could see the progressive changes and they knew where they were in the system. So a tremendously valuable set of, set of data. And, and from the, the previous slide, in this slide, They've, they've basically summarized the alteration into, into clumps, into groups, and that's very useful for some purposes. But here, you can really start to pick up the much more subtle variations, and in terms of doing geotechnical work or understanding your ore body, you're getting much more out of seeing all of these minerals than you are out of just a lump or gillic, or, or as, as people used to, to just lump all the clays into. So that's one really good example. It's written up by Dave Burroughs, who's chief was chief geologist, who's retired now from Valley, and it's in Economic Geology. It was published in 2020. So that's a really useful example. Another example that was used in mine evaluation um, is from the Kisladag mine in Turkey, which is a porphyry gold deposit owned by Eldorado Gold. And you can see it's located here. It's Turkey and then Greece over to the left there. Um, so in this case, the, alter the, the alteration is, is a bit different. It's a mixture of minerals that you can identify with, with the TerraSpec and those that you can't. So it has a tourmaline white mica assemblage, but it also has a tremendous amount of potassic alteration, which you can see with staining, but you don't pick up with the spectroscopy. And it also has zones of argillic assemblage, so it has clays in, included in it. So previously, what they had tried to do was to take these overprinting and variable alterations and, and try and summarize them into groups. And when they did that, and they did their wireframe modeling for the deposit, they kind of got these big lumps. There was a big potassic zone and a big advanced argillic zone. And, and then maybe there was this white mica tourmaline kind of, of wrapping around it. So that was where they were. And then what they did was they had spectroscopy. So they went back and they reprosed it all with Osiris, Osiris. And they did it based on which minerals had a, a basically statistically relevant uh, contribution to the spectral pattern. And we'll, we'll talk about what that means. And when they did that, they found a much greater detail in their model. So they were able to separate out zones that before had all been lumped into one thing. And this made a huge difference in terms of their, their ability to for geotechnical and for processing of, of the of the mine of the of the deposit. And in this case, there's over 85,000 spectra in this database that's that's helping to create these models. So again, lots and lots of data. And, and then an effective way to process that data with smart people who are looking at the rocks as well. So this gets to the lesson part. <laughs> How do we get that good data? And what does good data look like? And so we're just for, for forgive me for those who are spectral experts on this, on this uh, call, but we'll go back to the basics. We'll look at what we're actually looking at. So the top uh, line here is the waveform and we have the wave number. And then this is the wave length, this middle line here in, in terms of microns. So that is, is your, what we usually view wavelengths in is in microns. And then 
this come on this uh section of the infrared of the the the, the spectra is really where we start to get information on rocks. So obviously we use X-ray diffraction to do crystal lattice and we do mineral structures with X-ray. With UV invisible, obviously we can see the rock and we can take photographs and do RGB. So that's really useful. And then in the infrared here, this is where we're getting our spectral responses. And what's interesting here is what you're getting is actual vibration of molecules. And so the, the light that's being reflected or absorbed in the from the rock is actually because of the vibration of the molecules. It's not directly the mineral. And that is something that's really important to know. And we'll, we'll look at what those vibrations look like in terms of an absorption feature. So with a field portable spectrometer, most of the time we're using light that's right on the rock. And so there's a light source and then there's a detector that's getting the light back. So dark minerals often don't reflect very much back. That's one thing that that's important. But we are getting some light back and some not, depending on which molecules. So let's say aluminum hydroxyl is absorbing the light at a certain wavelength. And then we get this pattern. And this is what you may have all seen where you have features, troughs, and then you have higher points as well. So each of these troughs is really relates to a molecule. The whole thing together, if it's a single mineral, can be characteristic of a mineral and you can identify it as whatever it is if you if you if you want to or you can see multiple mixtures in there but there is nothing that will calculate that pattern for you exactly so this is a from a a ni really nice article that McLean Trot wrote that was in the applied geochemists um, uh, newsletter explore it came out in 2022 and he goes through the use of TSG, the spectral geologist, which is software that you can use to identify these, these patterns. And he also talks, goes through the basics of the whole technique. And so I really recommend reading that if, if, you're, if you're new to spectroscopy or you want to understand what you're actually looking at in terms of data. So for example, he has here showing us three patterns. The top, um, the top one is a muscovite, and then there's an alienite, and then there's a chlorite down at the bottom. So here, looking at this one feature B, and where he's highlighted it on the 2200 wavelength, at that one feature, you can see that it has some characteristics that are really important. It has a depth, it has a width, um, and it also has, and, and it has this a, a certain sharpness or crystallinity, if you will, at the at the base there, a point. So these things can all be characterized. And then that actually gives you even more information than you had before on whether or not you just, it's the mineral that you've got, but can you actually tell us something more about the mineral? And does that feature position tell you something about chemistry or crystallinity? And it turns out that yes, it does. So these are the important things, these positions of these features, what their general shape is, and you know, I always tell people to look at them, if you're looking at the spectra, to look at them without taking see this thing here called the, the hull. The hull is like a string draped over this whole spectrum. And often when we, we process data, we pull it straight and we make all the features kind of relative to each other. We, we make the, the top line straight and then these all hang off of that. Well, when you do that, you do lose some of the information on the characteristics of what the mineral is, and you just end up with feature positions and depths and not some of the other information. So it's really worth being able to look at these and see their original shape, as well as to possibly remove the hull. Somebody else might want to weigh in on that. I'm not, not a fan of removing my hull. <laughs> so these are some of the, the minerals. So in the, in the sh shorter wavelengths, so from the visible to through what we call the SWIR, the shortwave infrared, we're looking at a wavelength between 400 and 2,500 nanometers, basically. And originally the PIMA was just 900 to 2,500. And part of that is you pick the detector that goes into your instrument that works for the minerals, most of the minerals you really want. And we wanted to be able to do clays, 
phyllosilicates, alienite, um, some of the ammonia species, carbonates, and all those could be done with that wavelength. And then over time, we've been able to build instruments that expand it to the visible near infrared as well. So we can add in some iron based minerals and do hematite and goethite. And we will get to later also into the long wave. So, but right now, this is what we're looking at with the field spectrometers is basically visible plus a sphere. Some people will, will lump it all into one and just call it the visible near infrared but include the sphere. So it's really important to look at the actual wavelengths of whatever instrument you're using and see what it's actually doing as opposed to, to assuming that one term means something or the other, because there's a lot of variation in how terms are used. These are all the portable spectrometers and there's some ones that don't get used in exploration very much. Pima is no, no longer manufactured. Um, the halo has limited to no availability. As far as I know, there was a part in it that they can't get anymore. Um, there is an instrument here that's field portable that does long wave. So this is getting into to other minerals that we don't normally do with, with field portable instruments. And there's a couple of others that aren't really configured for rocks and geology. So that pretty much leaves us with this selection. So somewhere between a TerraSpec and the OrExpress instruments are your best choices. So when you're collecting these samples and the data, and, and you could have 85,000 or 100,000 spectra, and they could actually all be bad. And I've looked at some data sets where people have run thousands of analyses and not collected good data. And that's just, that's a real sad waste of, of human time and instrument time. So these are just some simple things that everybody needs to know that you need to be dry, that it needs to have direct sample contact, that you can use a variety of, of samples for sure. Um, but one of the key ones and, and something that we didn't really used to do a lot is this one to run standards and Mylar is a really good standard. And the reason we do that is that each of these instruments may have a slightly different um, calibration so kaolinite might be 2207 on one instrument. That's the wavelength position that where the main peak for kaolinite is, or it might be 2208. It might be a nanometer or two nanometers off. So then we go and try and put data sets together from different instruments, and we can't actually cross-reference them. We don't have a way of, of bringing them all to the same point. Then things that don't work very well, sulfides, wet stuff, uh, transparent things, measuring through glass and pulps also can be used, but you have to be extremely careful because it degrades your response and you don't get a good analysis. So I'm very wary of pulps. And when people send um, rocks to the lab and have like ALS use their spectrometer to analyze them, they're using the coarse reject, they're not using the pulp. So on top of all that, once you've got this good data, high quality data, then you also really need to be working. Your geologists are very involved in this, this setup. It's getting your references set up, getting project references, analyzing those frequently in your workflow and calibrating uh, and going back to the rocks. Once you have gotten some analyses and you've looked at what the mineralogy is, then going back to the rocks and either recalibrating your eye or assessing what your data is, is like. So when we talked about um, El Dorado's work at Kisheldag, what they were doing was spectral contribution. So some um, mineral ID programs will tell you, you have alienite and kaolinite. Well, if you look at these two, two uh, examples here in the middle of the slide, so the blue there is alienite and there's biotite, white mica and kaolinite. You could have two analyses that give you two rocks that give you exactly the same analysis, but actually one only has some of those minerals in it and, and maybe the rest of the rock is not altered. And the other is completely pervasively altered. So it, this is what we mean by spectral contribution. So this altered component of the rock on the left here, this orange part, that's all that we're getting from the spectrometer. And we're still getting this split in the different minerals that are present. On the right, that orange, that whole rock is altered. And then we're getting this example of 
of the same minerals. So it's really important to know that we are not getting quantitative analyses. There are proxies and we can we can start to play with that with various techniques, but we're not getting a quantitative whole rock analysis. We are just getting what's spectrally active, what will respond to the spectrometer that we're using and which wavelengths we have for the what data we're collecting. Does that make sense? Yeah, everybody's like, yeah, okay, yeah, we know I read, done that. Okay, so <laughs> the uh, maybe later we can discuss about. Okay, happy to. Well, I'll, I'll call some Thank other you. people in who are on the call. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, um, it would be nice to to listen from you. Uh, what is really the spectral contribution means? Because sometimes is useful and maybe sometimes can be not useful. Absolutely. And for me, that's really what, you know, smart spectroscopy is in, in, in almost every situation that certainly I've worked in. There's no one approach that necessarily works every time. You, you got to yeah. work with the rocks you have and you've got to figure out which spectral attributes, scalars, if you want to call them that, work to define, to help you. Um, but what I'd encourage yes. people is to try a variety of things. And, and you know, if one thing that you've used everywhere work doesn't work, that, that doesn't mean that there isn't something else that might work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that is yeah. the exact, exactly the moment oh. to, to ask you yeah. if, if, it's, if, if it's okay. Yeah. Because this is a quality technique instead of quantity. So Correct. That, that is the main question when to use as a quantifying or because most of the time we are seeing quality of minerals. Most, yeah, most of the time you're seeing a qualitative, but you also have hopefully people logging core, drill logging. So you, you should have some idea of how pervasive or, or whether it's selective alteration along veins, whether it's pervasive alteration of the rock, you should have some general idea at least of, of that nature of it. But it is an alteration in general, it's um, notoriously difficult to assess what it means if you have a lot of alteration versus a little alteration, because that depends on how hard the rock is, how much uh, rock fluid flow is through it, all sorts of other factors that don't necessarily imply size of deposit or what, what your target is like. So again, it requires, it requires with geologists and it requires yeah. people who understand you know the the rock and the deposit type that they're looking at, yeah. But you're you right. Are right. It is quite it is qualitative. But there there are ways we can get around that. I mean, so if I was making a project reference set, you know, and sometimes we do this is to use quantitative XRD XRD on you know twenty or fifty samples, and I would also use petrography, and I would also use maybe even some SEM or other techniques to characterize yeah. your project reference set, right? And then you take that and you go back and you compare it to your spectral data. So the spectral data you should be able to get over your entire project. And then the other data, the other data you should be able to, oops, got feedback there. The other data you should be able to, to, to use to correlate with that and, and use it basically then develop proxies. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, I I don't want to spend more time because okay, you yeah, continue. no, no, we'll go, we'll go on, but it, but yeah. for for me, it's it's it really is important to do some of the other fundamental work as well. I mean, there's lots you can see from this. You know a lot about the rock, and it's not like it's not helpful. It's totally is, but if you're really getting into understanding an ore body, then you'd want to have some project references, in my opinion. <laughs> So this is just an example of an Osiris output that now is um, wrapped into Imdex. Imdex uh, bought out OSPEC, and, and this, you can't see all the details of it, but basically there just are lots of different ways that you can get lots of different data. You can get wavelength positions for different spectra. You can get different depths, crystallinities, and then of course across the top is very similar to what we looked at with the Onto data, where you're getting going down holes, you're getting mineral contributions of, of minerals to the spectra. So that you can get now um, fairly 
that goes through the cloud and it's it's a, a desktop kind of cloud setup which is quite efficient and I should have said I think with the new with the new um, development of it AI Swift now is means that there used to be a fewer a few day turnaround and now it's more or less real time. So then there's a spectral geologist, which was really the, the thing that most people have used and has gone through several um, iterations. Uh, and it is incredibly useful for also being able to look at the spectra yourself and being able to compare to references and to actually do some of your own manipulation and work with these various um, attributes of spectra that you might want to, to study or look at. It does give mineral ID. We know that most mineral ID can't be 100%, 100% correct 100% of the time. So we are going back again to the geologists in the context to, to cross check and to, and to validate data. Um, this example, the drill hole the, at the top is a drill hole, it's going down hole. So it's just horizontal instead of vertical. And then the um, on the bottom, the same data is actually showing differences in the 2200 wavelength position of mica. So you can see that that's changing and, and that might be very useful information. So beyond field spectrometers. So we talked about this explosion of everything that's happened. So obviously um, we could do this work with handhelds, but one of the things with handhelds is you're selecting a spot. So the idea with the scanner is that you get the whole rock or the whole drill core that's that's in your sample set and you're not so you're able to see everything and not just one you know one centimeter spot and then having to to um, generalize what one centimeter means for the whole rock. So this is just a schematic from um, the Helmholtz Institute from Richard Glogan's work and he's published a few things on scanners which is they're helpful because you can start to understand a bit more about how they set up and and again what questions you might want to ask your service providers so these are various he's got the spectral cameras here these he's in his diagram are specim cameras and then there's a light source halogen light source and the rock or the drill core is is basically moving um, past these um, cameras or detectors and usually there's also mounted on here a um, RGB, so basically a camera camera. So you get great photography of your rocks as well. And they can have, you know, one or two, um, they can have different wavelengths. So you can, and you can add the long wave as well. So this is from my most recent uh, exploration of the world, all the scanners you can get. Now, these are not all spectral scanners, hyperspectral scanners, but people are starting to add other things like XRF to the workflow. And so it's useful to know which of these are doing which. Um, CoreScan is now, um, as they say, powered by EpiRock, and I believe they are operating the HiLogger as well within that that group. Um, Terracore is a hyperspectral scanner and, and both HiLogger and Terracore will do long wave as well. And then Geologger, which is a completely different and interesting instrument that, that does approaches the whole problem from a completely different angle. And we'll talk about that. Then there's XRF, which so you're basically just getting elemental analysis from Minalize and TrueScan. And then there's groups who are trying to combine the XRF and they're analyzing using XRF and spectroscopy in the same scanning workflow. So that would be Geotech out of the UK and Geologic AI out of Canada. And then lastly, in Quebec, in Canada, there's a group who are promoting use of a, a scanner that does LIBS, which is laser-induced ablation um, spectroscopy. And so they can actually manage, they can an actually analyze light elements. So again, they're getting minerals from chemistry um, and they can do light elements, but it's not anywhere near as fast as using the straight spectral instruments. So example acts, uh, uh, output from, from CoreScan here. So what we're looking at is 
an image. So instead of just those bars of like so much alienite or so much kaolinite, now we're looking at a pixel, basically. You're looking at an image. So one pixel, in this case, the orange pixel, is actinolite. So then it gets mapped. So and then all the orange dots are actinolite, and then all the green ones are a different mineral. So now when we've got a drill core, so this is the core on the left, the, the photograph of the core, and now we look at it with this, the spectral map, we can see all the different minerals and we can start to see textures and people are starting doing um, structural analysis with this and all sorts of things. So here is all the minerals together. Then we have an iron chloride map of where the iron chloride is, a map of the actinolite and a map of the calcite. So you can start to pull apart the drill core and really see all the mineralogy and how it relates to each other. But the long wave is also really interesting and it was, uh, Syro and John and John's work with Heilager that really put this on the map. Uh, this image here is from the TerraCore instrument. And the thing that we can do with this long wave, so short wave I was saying before is 900 to 2500 nanometers. So that's 0.9 to 2.5 microns in wavelength. In this long wave, in this we're looking at 8 to 14 microns. So it's a much further along the wavelength spectrum. And in that realm, what you can see are silicates, and you can see pyroxenes and feldspars and your potassic alteration, garnets, uh, apatites, and, and actually probably and quartz. So it really suddenly becomes, if you have all of them all together, you really start to potentially be able to map the mineralogy of the rock in a much more uh, quantitative way and, and much more um, flexibility in terms of where and what deposit types you might want to be looking at it. So an example of, of using the long wave, which is a TerraCore example from a project in, in Nevada, and here they're looking at a Carlin type deposit. So notoriously fine grain dark rocks don't respond terribly well to short wave infrared um, wavelengths. They, they, they give us something, but they really don't give us a lot. So this is an advanced exploration project and they decided to run um, the TerraCore instrument over, over their core and trying to identify differences in, in carb um, silicification and carbonate. So here's an example. So from the short wave, basically we're really getting very no, very poor to no response, that top line there of the drill map of the drill core. In the long wave, they're starting to see much more variation. And so we're actually starting to pull out um, variations in in quartz and ferroin calcite and clay. And um, so they're really getting much more definition of zones of calcification and zones of silicification. And this was the key thing that they were trying to find. And if you look here on the left is the photo of the rock. So you can see, find it. I mean, this stuff is horrible. It's rubbly, it's dark, it's fine grained. The short wave is not responding at all, but in the long wave, they are picking up these variations in the in the silicification and the clay and the and the carbonate. And so, using this, they were able to do a new interpretation of the structure and mineralizing structures, and they were able to identify much more favorable horizons for drilling. So, a big success for the long wave. Some other work in Carlin type deposits, which was published by Rocky Barker in 2021, um, this is in economic geology as well. And he actually took, uh, did a, on a small scale, some training data with long wave and micro XRF. So these are just very small slabs. You can see the scale bar here is three centimeters across. On the left in each pair is the micro XRF and um, mapping mapping quartz on the green, and then the, the yellow is the white mica. But then he compared it and he used a random forest model to process the data to the long wave results. And you can see actually with the long wave, he's starting to see very similar, very not quite as much detail in the, in the texture, but quite a lot. And so in this case, uh, using that technique, he felt the results were equivalent and they were checked with quantitative XRD, that he was getting equivalent to quantitative XRD. So 
and that was using a training set. So we used the, the micro XRF to train the long wave. And again, so that's going back to this idea of having references and, and being able to do more with your data once you have characterized the samples more closely. And lastly, here's the geologger. And this instrument isn't like a lot of the instruments are in containers, shipping containers, and they go around the world in the, in the container or you bring your rocks to them. The geologger is extremely portable. It's this little thing on a bar on wheels, and you basically can put your core out on the, on the floor and you can just basically run, move the instrument, it goes up and down the core, move the instrument, it goes up and down the core. And so there's a lot less movement of core. It's um, a lot less expensive. The key thing to know about it, and this is um, put out by Hyperspectral Intelligence who are based here in Vancouver. Key thing to know about it is it's only shortwave, but it doesn't give you a mineral identifications. So it won't pull apart the, the data to, to identify all your different minerals. It basically does it on a totally objective, if you will, uh, machine learning, analysis, data analysis, where it just defines lithotypes. But people are finding it to be extremely useful in deposit development and for doing geotechnical work, because they can define these lithotypes or these sections of rock, which are important for processing one way or processing another way. And it's accessible and lower cost and extremely effective. And so I think it's a really interesting alternative approach, um, as long as you understand what it is you're getting. So the industry is doing a ton of great work. They're the best people are doing references and, and curated spectral libraries, collecting tens of thousands of data points and, and using it to refine their maps and drill logs and update their models. But what is it that we don't know? What is it that, what are the challenges still left? And I actually think there are, I mean, there's probably lots of challenges. There's certainly always lots of challenges in instrument development and data analysis but in the actual understanding of the spectroscopy, one of the challenges that's still left is getting a better grip on white mica compositions. So one of the things that we've done for years, and, and this work by Scott and Yang was, was um, really important in terms of identifying this fact that we have a 2200 nanometer feature here in these micas, and you can see that it changes wavelength position. It's moving here in this set from left to right. So it's going from us lower number to a higher number. And that's blown up here over on the right between the paragonite, muscovite, and fengite. And so it, this has been really useful. And we have used this, this variation in chemical composition empirically in, in numerous places. Um, but what does it really mean? And I guess that's the question that, that still is a little bit out there. So there's two things about it. Um, one is that people are starting to, as in this study um, in 2022, Furkan on Grassberg, they're starting to try and put, to put models with wavelength positions of white mica on them. So here we're looking at a porphyry copper deposit model. And you know, Scott Halley has done this as well. And you're trying to identify zones in the alteration where you'll see white mica of different compositions. Well, that's actually quite possibly true in any given deposit. The thing that worries me about a, a studies such as this, where we try to composite it all together is one, they're all gonna be different instruments. Two, they're gonna be collected by all sorts of different people in different ways. And, and three, most of these data sets, because he's using academically collected data sets, most of these data sets are pretty small. And unless we're collecting tens of thousands of analyses, then statistically, I'm not going to be comfortable with, you know, typing a whole zone as 2204 illite. I think it's really important to, to have large data sets before we start to, to, to uh, lump things together like that. And the I other, got, sorry. Can I ask you a question in your previous slide, please? Yep. Sorry to be someone who is asking. Sorry, sorry. No, it's okay. Um, look, uh, this is an ideal model for me. Um, it is not including a telescoping, for instance, where these 
2,200 value is going to be changing because it's going to be uh, mixed with a mixture of caolinite or others, right? Yep, yep. No, I mean, you're you're not. This is this. Is, it's like any model. You're adding, putting numbers on something which is still just a model and which absolutely yeah. there will be telescoping, there will be overprinting. And, and mm-hmm. so figuring out those relationships takes time and effort. Okay, thank you. Okay. So some other recent work by John Cloutier, um, 2021, looking at with Steve Piercy, he looked, the, looked at the wavelength variation again in the white micas. And in white mica has something that's called the Chermak substitution, where basically aluminum is substituting for silicon. So you don't necessarily have a straight cation substitutions. And we always talk about the composition of the white mica as, as whether it's iron rich or um, magnesium rich or sodium rich, but it's actually not a one for one substitution across the whole spec, the whole mineral. And it's important to also realize, and so the work here that, that basically what these graphs are, are representing on the, the bottom one in particular, the, the red line here is if you have a one-to-one substitution of a really good mica. And so you can see a change in the wavelength position, but you see a different change the more interlayer vacancies you have. So basically the more it becomes elytic, the, the the less likely it's going to follow this very nice change in composition. So it's really important to recognize that if you're doing absolute mica compositions, that it might be important to only do it when you have your cleanest, nicest micas as opposed to applying it to elites. And so that's just a, it's just a caution, but I think part of the, what's needed here is, is again, the more detailed work where we can often with a spectrometer, we're we're not getting the nanoscale or the micron scale of a mineral. We're not, and there are systems that will do that. And USGS can is working with a microscope with a spectrometer on it. But we're trying to compare a general analysis on a clump of or a spot in a rock to a microprobe analysis. And so you're comparing two different scales. So there definitely needs, in my mind, more work to be done and probably in a few minerals where we're actually getting a much better idea of what is the spectrum associated with the actual mineral as we might see it in a in a thin section as opposed to trying to generalize. How's that? People can talk about that one. Okay, alienite, another one that I wanna be always emphasize caution. So there's a lot of work has happened and, and Phoebe and I, this is actually my microprobe work from back in the in the early 90s. And you can identify a difference in alienite between potassic alienite, sodic, or even calcium and potassic or ammonia alienite. You can see these changes in these features over here on the left. And this between potassium and sodium, this one feature changes wavelength position quite significantly. So it's been attempted to use that again as a gradual thing or as a um, vector towards mineralization in lithocaps and porphyry systems and epithermal systems. But if you see this this thin section down here, this is very common in, in magmatic hydrothermal systems. You see nice bands around the edges of the alunite. So sometimes what you're seeing is actually mixtures zoning in one in one crystal. And so that that's something to bear in mind. The other thing that's really important is, and Dale and Dipple showed this in their paper in 2005, is that the host rock from which the fluids are flowing through will also change the chemistry of that alunite. So it's not just a temperature thing. It's not just related to sodium being higher temperature. You can have supergene alunite that's sodic rich. And, and so again, for me, the alienite composition thing, you just have to be super careful. And maybe in certain situations it works like far Southeast and maybe in lots of situations it doesn't work. So for academia, I think I would love to see more um, people working with 
industry and more collaboration. So industry needs to reach out as well. Some of these large data sets are extremely valuable. They have tons that can be done with them. And so if we could get more connection between the researchers and the industry with those data sets, such as was done with Onto and um, also with, with uh, Kisodag and Turkey. More careful calibration of different spectrometers and, and you know, academia and researchers need to, to recognize that issue. Um, more detailed mineral chemistry and, and understanding of what our references actually really mean and what more can we get out of them in terms of mineral, understanding different minerals. And then continued advancement, obviously, of the data collection tools that, that people are working on. So, and, you know, it all helps us understand the whole history of, of are these processes through, through space and time. So smart spectroscopy depends on human skills. So, you know, none of this is going to be done without critical thinking, collaboration, teamwork, knowledge sharing, all of those things. That it's not just about having the coolest scanner or it's not just about having lots of data. There's a lot more there. And certainly the geologist is fundamental in that picture. So thank you. So happy for any discussion people can have at me. Thank you so much. That was an excellent overview. I really appreciate you taking the time. So thank you.